<laughs> you will have the blood you hunger for. With Halloween right around the corner uh, today, I figured now was the perfect time to talk about Legacy of Cain Blood Omen. As you'll soon see, it's a perfect aesthetic for the holiday. However, there's a good chance I've already aggravated some people. The official title is Blood Omen Legacy of Cain. This could be hard to tell from the logo. If you weren't aware already, this is a series of games and the naming scheme is very convoluted across all of them. So we start with Blood Omen Legacy of Cain and the Legacy of Cain part is huge on every version of the game. Then they switched it around for the sequel. Now it's titled Legacy of Cain Soul Reaver, but the Soul Reaver part in the logo is gigantic. So it's settled. These are the Legacy of Cain games, right? Nope. The sequel is just called Soul Reaver 2. What? That one was followed up by Blood Omen 2 and finally Legacy of Cain Defiance. It's a complete mess. So I'm going to call it Legacy of Cain Blood Omen because that's what makes sense. Don't you dare bring up that other one. Nowadays, most people are familiar with the Soul Reaver games and Defiance. For being what kicked off the series, Blood Omen doesn't get talked about that much. For one, this is a top-down 2D game in a series that became known for its 3D games. Second, you can only buy it officially on PlayStation hardware. On PC, you can't buy it digitally at all. It's legal issues, according to a Polish man. So let's get started. The opening is dark, dramatic, and violent. It'll also be a while until the game tells you exactly what was happening here. These cutscenes were really impressive back in the day, but they haven't aged like wine. Nowadays, the murderous vampire looks more like a cereal box mascot. Like I said before though, this is pretty damn violent for 96. It's not Harvester, but that lady's skin exploded off. We do that with Proactive these days. After Wizard 101's Murder by Vampire, the game gets going. Tavern's closing! Best be on your way, stranger! What? No mug of ale for a weary traveler from distant Corhagen? I can reward you well, for I am of noble blood. This is our titular Kane. A traveling noble denied a place to stay, and things only get worse from there. Kane is immediately ambushed by assassins, and there's no way out. You can kill as many as you want, but they keep coming and there's no escape. So, Kane gets the revolutionary's handshake. <coughs> Kane goes directly to hell. He's quite literally burning with a desire for revenge. He gets an offer to be brought back for revenge by the necromancer Mortanius. Not caring about the terms and conditions, Kane signs up for it. And now he's a vampire. Right from the get-go, it's a visual treat. It's a very moody looking game. The sprite work is great and the animations are very fluid. Plus, look at all the effects here. The lightning, the rain, and of course the blood sucking. This game has a weather system. Sometimes it gets a little darker, rain comes in slowly, and then it picks up. Same for snow. It adds on very nicely to the day-night cycle. It's not just a switch flip of day or night. The environment can change depending on the time of day it is. Since you'll be backtracking from time to time, it's nice to make those areas look a little bit different. The game already has a good variation of outdoor environments, so it's like a bonus on top of that. Not to say that indoors are ugly. They're typically even better. The game is so colorful, but the lighting keeps it moody. Some games, particularly horror games, stray away from having vibrant colors like this. They're usually trying to maintain an oppressive atmosphere, and I get that. Horror-themed games being brown or gray isn't unusual. Having a red and gold environment look ominous? Well, that's been a while for me. When there are generic medieval dungeons, they're lit nicely. The other areas are gorgeous. No matter how exotic or colorful they are, they always maintain an aura of being creepy. This wasn't a Halloween pick for nothing. Speaking of that, check out the enemies. You've got grave robbers, dark wizards, skeletons, zombies, boogies, werewolves, gypsies, possessed toys, evil scarecrows, demons from hell, and one very annoying druid. The visual presentation is outstanding. On a Halloween scale, it doesn't quite reach Pete Castlevania, but it's up there. Then you have the sound. Unfortunately, the sound effects are very generic and really not worth talking about. In comparison, the music is great and some of the tracks are phenomenal. Check out the theme for the Evil Toymaker dungeon. That is devilishly good. The voice acting is also something special, but I'm gonna hold off on that for a bit. Let's get into the gameplay. This is an action-adventure game. If you've ever played Zelda A Link to the Past or similar adventure games, a lot of this may sound familiar to you. Though, as we've gone over, the presentation is a little... different. You're pressing forward in your quest for revenge, but sometimes you come to an obstacle. You'll pass a lot of caves and dungeons on your journey. Look into them. 
While not always mandatory, they give Kang new powers or equipment. One of your first abilities is being able to transform into a werewolf. It has really nice hair too, like it's a L'Oreal werewolf. That's not something I want to Google. Anyways, the wolf form is much faster than Kane, but more important than that, the wolf can jump. So now you can go up and down cliffs and across platforms that you couldn't before. Near the start of the game, there's a graveyard, and you can't get past some of the fences. But now you can come back and jump it as the werewolf. Now you can explore around more and fight for new items, and this is all optional. To sweeten the deal, backtracking like this usually isn't a huge chore. Even before your wolf ability, you can turn to a swarm of bats. This is your fast travel system. As you explore around, you occasionally find a bat tower. You just have to stand on it to activate it. Once you do, you can then travel back there at any time. If that's not enough, Kane also has a sanctuary spell which takes you back to the very first screen in the game. This is useful when you want to use the world's most evil looking save station. Those layers of convenience are really encouraging to go back and look around. When you gain new powers and forms, the way you look at the map changes. Even checking out a mundane area that was once inaccessible could reveal a secret. This game has tons of secrets. Being a vampire, Kane has issues with running water, which includes the rain. That problem can be fixed with a cursed fountain, but as for bodies of water, no such luck. Then, way later into the game, you can turn to a cloud of mist and walk across bodies of water and through certain walls. So now, a ton of areas you've been through have even more to explore. This keeps going until nearly the very end. There's so much to collect, and you want to collect it. You might think Kane exaggerates. He doesn't. Of all the methods I employ, this is perhaps the cruelest. Causing my victim's body to shrink on itself, crushing bones and rupturing organs till the pressure inside bursts the sack of fleshy skin, spraying its contents for all to see. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, uh, yeah, Kane doesn't really fuck around. The thirst for new items comes quickly, mainly due to the combat. Melee attacking is only one button, but if you press it in the right pace, then you get a combo attack. And that's it. It's simple, repetitive, and becomes ineffective. So you have two additional options, artifacts and spells. They occupy the same window. Artifacts come from these cards you collect. It's simple enough, one use for each card. These can be stupidly powerful, with some able to clear a screen of enemies in a second. These don't have any kind of cooldown. The only limiting factor is how many you have, so going out of your way to collect them makes fights later on much faster and easier. Then you have spells. These are also incredibly powerful. The difference is, once you learn a spell, you have it on you forever. No use per item like artifacts. Instead, you have to use magic, which is represented by the runes on the right side of the screen. However, some spells require having enough base magic to cast it in the first place, so you need to hunt around for those too. The scarcity of spells and artifacts means it won't be replacing your main weapon, at least not early on. Kane is a vampire, so his health is always slowly draining. He needs to have some people gushers to fix that. You occasionally find people chained to the wall that you can snack on. They could be locked in a dungeon, or a town brothel gets a little crazy. No matter where, you can suck the blood right out of them, from range. When you can't get it from a prisoner, you can get it from some enemies in combat. Right before they die, they start staggering around, and that's when you give them the graveyard suck. Now, Kane is a classy vampire, which means he won't lick it off the floor. The results of most of your artifacts and spells won't be something you can feed on. You do have some that can help feed, but these can use a lot of magic. I want to save that for the good stuff. You can upgrade your max health just like magic, but it's always ticking down, so you need new ways to feed. Going to town is a good way to do this, and it's a fun twist on regular adventure games. You still resupply and get new items from town, but not from talking to the people. You break in everywhere and kill them and rob them blind. The day-night cycle comes into play here too. People will be out in the streets during the day, but you'll have to deal with the guards if you want to get them. Nobody's asleep during the day. Just wait for night and then creep into town and suck them dry while they're sleeping. You'll also receive weapons that can make the process easier against regular enemies. The spiked mace does less damage, but will stun your enemies for longer. And you bet it opens up new areas. With the axes, you can't use any items, which is awful. But you do get a really good combo attack. <coughs> And you can cut down trees. Pretty cool. Accursed gypsies. Bring in their wicked magic. No Scoth will never be the same. Hmm. The gypsies. Purveyors of distrust and superstition. Most of their babble should be taken with a pinch of salt, since the gypsies often tinker with weary travelers' minds. However, a few gypsies have something interesting to say. It's weird. The only gypsy magic you learn is being able to transform into a poor migrant. But so many people you talk to in the disguise form are concerned about the gypsies. Not the rich vampire who's coming into town, blowing people up, and sucking out all of their blood. Maybe this was during the Frollo era. Then again, these gypsies have a lot of knives. 
The weapons are but a token of my goodwill. And the news you bring, a vampire said to slay me? Wait. Where did you come upon such knowledge? That's right, Frollo, I mean, Tony J is in this game. He was also in War of the Ring. What does this all mean? Where was I going with this? What the? What the hell is that sound? The game has some problems. It's mainly to do with the combat. Sometimes enemies will be stuck inside you and you have to wiggle out of them. Sometimes they get stuck inside each other and beat their friends up to death. An enemy being stuck in a wall is not uncommon and they'll probably get you stuck as well. It's also clear that the hitboxes don't match up to the sprite animation. Enemies can swing at you and not hit a thing and vice versa. These problems show up the most when something is diagonal. It's almost like the idea of being able to go diagonal was something thought up later. So many attacks that should miss hit and the other way around. In fact, if an enemy is diagonal, their attacks go right through walls. The result is combat that can feel really janky. Taking damage knocks you back, so if you're not careful, you can be wombo comboed to death. These guys in particular can drive you crazy. But the game has so many powers to give you that if you seek them out, you could overcome it very easily. Once I got the repel spell, it was useful for just about every single boss fight. Except that one guy early on when I didn't have it. It probably wouldn't have helped anyways. Honestly, the game barely has balance. The more powerful you become, the more the game starts to break down. It's nearly impossible to lose. When you lose all of your blood, you die. But you're revived by an item called the Heart of Darkness, and you won't be forgetting that name anytime soon. The Heart of Darkness. The Heart of Darkness. The Heart of Darkness. Ugh. You can use the artifact before you die to restore even more blood. It activates on its own as insurance. Even if you don't go out of your way, you'll find tons of them. If you do go out of your way, you'll find even more. Occasionally, you find a forge where you can exchange blood for artifacts. These will give you some of them, and yeah, there's one for hearts too. But if you mind control someone, you can offer their entire body as a sacrifice. After that, your troubles are over. You can have limitless casting and just stroll around while everything dies around you. Hell, if you use the wolf form, you can avoid a lot of combat by just running past it. Blood Omen isn't very challenging. Even if you went out of your way to limit yourself, then you'd just be stuck with awkward combat instead of easy combat. The fun comes from exploring all the dungeons and finding all the secrets to try and become as absurdly powerful as possible. Then you've got Kane himself. Kane is a noble. The town of Stenshin Crow bore with it the infamous aroma of its inhabitants. In life, I would not have graced the place with my presence. In death, I merely added to the stench. The village of Nachtholm was typical of Nosgoth peasantry. Yet amidst the farmers and smithies of the quiet country life prowled brigands and cut purses. Nupraptor, this broken, pathetic little man. Yet crippled as he was, he would not yield without battle. Very well, old fool. If it is death you seek, I will not deny you. I know a lot of people attribute Metal Gear Solid as being the first game to have really quality voice acting, but there are other contenders out there, and I think this might have been the best in the world for a while. Victor! The wind carried screams from the west. I couldn't help but smile. Someone else in this world was suffering more than I. Edgy. I would not be kind to the denizens that lurk here. They would taste my steel, and I, their blood. He's the perfect protagonist for a game like this. The excellent writing combined with his delivery really invests you in his quest for revenge. You're not only being carried by exploring new dungeons and unlocking new powers, you want to see Kane's reaction to all of it. Kane doesn't just talk for story events or locations, he does it when he finds a new item. This spell allows me to enslave my enemies, giving me control of their bodies. When I release my grip, their bodies will shrivel and die as I displace their souls and replace them with my own. The story has some twists to it, though some parts won't fit in the later games. Like Zelda, you start getting into time travel shenanigans and other alternate realities. If I do a video on the next game, I'll start getting into the finer points of Blood Omen. For now, I only want to talk about the very, very end of the game. There's literally a good ending button and an evil ending button. The good ending is just a flyover of trees talking about how you save the world. They use the same kind of cutscene sometimes you travel in bat form, so this is really tacked on. It's also out of nowhere and makes no sense for Kane. It's a nice ending for the sake of having one. I had crossed death for this moment. My mind was empty save for one thought. I would kill. <sighs> yeah, he seems like a hero. So of course you choose the correct ending. The one that has him sitting on a skeleton throne, smugging about how great he is. Now that's Kane. It's a good game, and I'd recommend it if you're into the dungeon adventure genre. Depending on what you have, this could be a harder game to actually play, but maybe it'll be easier in the future. Well, I've got candy to hand out. Have a happy Halloween. Come back for the first video on a card game, and then after that...
The Walking Game. And as always, thanks to all the people making this possible. I don't think I would have had a Halloween video otherwise. Out of my way, peasant. The stench of the fields hangs over you like a pall.